inside. Hopefully those watching online are dry. Um, let me ask if you would go ahead and take out your Bibles and uh, take out something to take notes with. And um, uh, on the back of your worship folder, if you have a worship folder with you, hopefully you do, uh, there's a place for you to doodle or uh, at least to make me think you're taking notes, but hopefully you are. As we continue, um, I know last week being gone, so we took a break, but now as we continue, as we walk through the Gospel of Matthew. And this weekend, uh, we are in Matthew. Say Matthew for me. Matthew. Matthew. Chapter 5, verse 9. Say Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. And then after you do that, I want you to take a big gulp. And whatever that looks like to you, just a big gulp, okay? And I want you to let it go all the way down and say, and then I want you to say this with me. Say, I'm going to let it go all the way down. Okay, and y'all just said, you're going to let this message go all the way down, okay? Um, you understand what I mean by that as we dive into this. And... Um, I want to begin this weekend with just starting with a few questions, and I want to ask you, and I think once you start to hear the question, you'll understand why. I want to ask you not to verbally answer out loud the answer to these questions, please. But I do want to encourage you and ask you to write the answers down. Um, so as you're taking notes, as you hear these questions, I just want you to write the answers down. And some of you might be going, as you write the answers down, might be trying, okay, wait a minute, I don't want no one to see that, but I want you to write these down so for you to go back and to pray over or to look at later on uh, as we walk through this message, I think you'll understand. I think today this is probably um, one of the... I like to say anytime we're studying God's Word is important, but I would like to say that this is probably the most important sermon that we have dove into in peace and work, Word of God in a long time. And it's so um, relating to our culture, society. But here's the questions as we get started. Um, again, don't answer out loud, okay? Have you ever, have you ever started an argument? Have you ever started an argument? If so, write that down. Or just write yes. And, and, and if you started one recently, then of course yes. But then write down who it was with. Or maybe just some way you would know who it was with and you don't want people to see. Or maybe the person that it was with is sitting beside you. Um, so maybe from that standpoint. But if you've ever started an argument, write it down. Then... On top of that, have you ever rushed to tell people to get your side of the story out first? Have you ever rushed to tell people, whether it be on, now on social media, or if you've been a part of a group in an argument or discussion or disagreement, you wanted your side out first. You wanted people to hear your part of the story first before the other part of the story was told. Everybody tracking with me so far? Doing good? Okay. Next question. Have you ever gotten into an argument with another follower of Christ? If so, what was it about or what was it over? Next question. Have you ever been a part of an argument argument within the church? Disagreement, argument, however you want to word it. If so, then make the answer down. And if so, what was it over? <coughs> and then last question. What was the outcome? What was the outcome? Now, some of you are probably thinking after you hear those questions, we're not going to let him go on vacation no more. <laughs> Never again. Um, but I want to ask you to stick with me, and we're going to come back to this. Um, and, and as we walk through what I, we see Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. Remember, Matthew's audience is primarily to whom? Anybody remember? You can answer. It's primarily to whom? Anybody know? Remember? Primarily to Jews. 
Matthew's gospel is primarily written to Jews. Keep that in mind. Before we do, I want to just share a little bit more as we lead into this. In a recent survey, say recent. recent. In a recent survey taken among, amongst those who say uh, that they are followers of Christ or claim to be Christians that are involved in attending church, they were asked in this survey multiple of questions. Anybody ever uh, took part in a survey before? Okay. Um, social media survey, anything like that. Anybody ever got a phone call and they ask, hey, will you take a quick survey? Anybody, something like that? Raise your hand. Okay. So you all know what to talk. And they were asked a series of questions. One of the questions they were asked was this question. They were asked how they chose the church they attended. And a series of questions. One of the questions was, how did you choose? How did you decide? Whether it be individually or as a family, how did you decide that this is where that, that church is where you would make your home? That's the church that you would attend. Ninety percent. Say ninety percent for me. Ninety percent. Ninety percent came back, and this was their answer. Ninety percent answered this question now this way. Ninety percent said that they chose where they would go to church, where they would belong as a follower of Christ, where they would engage in study, where they would be a part of worship. Ninety percent said that they would go to that they based where they would go to church based on political affiliation. In other words, ninety percent said they had chose the church that they attend, not based on whether Scripture was being taught or not, not based on God's word, not based on the, the, the preacher, pastor, minister, staff, children's ministry, programming, whatever, none of that. It was based, 90% said they made the decision to attend church based on that we chose this because they share the same political view that I do. Whatever political view that is. 90% said. In a recent study to gauge Americans' view of the Bible, Americans were asked, in the study, they were asked various questions again to kind of gauge their study, but they were asked whether they believe, one of the questions was, whether they believe the Bible is sufficient for meaningful life. For meaningful life. Those born prior to 1946 65% agree that the Bible is sufficient for the meaning of life. 65%. The number decreased to 56% among boomers. Among those classified as Gen Xers dropped to 40%. And those who classified, depending on, and, and, and the reason I'm not giving a lot of these numbers is because they change based on, these are generationals where they fit based on, but millennials that and this, again, is, people have different numbers on this, but millennials bet born between 1985 to 1998 dropped to just 27% believe that the Bible is sufficient for mean meaning meaningful li living. And if you go on down to generations keep dropping, the number keeps dropping. On vacation, I, I really didn't plan on this. It just kind of happened this way. I saw app, I saw very little TV. In fact, the only TV basically that I watched the whole time I was on vacation, which was completely awesome, was I watched a U.S. soccer game that I went to watch. And it became such a blowout that I didn't cut it out. I saw absolutely no news the whole time I was on vacation. It was awesome. And you know what? I didn't miss a thing because there's other people around, all around, that are filling you in on what's going on, whether there's conversations when you're out to eat and you hear. There's an all around, so you really don't miss nothing, even when you're not watching. So it was absolutely fantastic. But we live in a culture today, we live in a society today that is so heightened. Everybody's looking for an argument. Everybody's got an opinion. Everybody has ideas. I mean, we come off COVID, and we, you, 
you see, COVID was devastating in so many different ways. It devastated families in so many different ways. And one of the ways is because no one agreed on anything. Politically, no one agrees on anything. Everything, we see all these divides, and everybody's looking and hunting and wants to share their opinion. If you go on social media, it is everywhere. Everywhere. But here's the thing, although it's heightened, and I don't ever remember in my young 53 years of life <laughs> it being this heightened, it's really nothing new. But at the same time, in the culture where God has planted it, is this time period, is such a time as this, in this season of life, we can't be so naive not to think, and it has, and it will, and it is continuing to make its way into the church. Say church, capital C. Church, church capital C, okay? As the church as a whole, these opinions, these ideas, all these things make their way into our and had been. And, and it's a way that the evil one makes his way in to separate, to divide, to, to create uh, all different kinds of separations for us to keep us from accomplishing the mission that God has called us to accomplish. And that is to make disciples. How many of you think, let me, let me just throw this out, how many of you think that all of us in this room agree with one another? Raise your hand if you think that. <coughs> Nobody. I bet no one online would, would say that, think that as well. We have different ideas and different opinions and different things. We think about different things. And I want you to write down in your notes. Write this down, please. That's okay. That's okay. Listen to what Jesus says. Matthew is sharing with us these words. We've been walking through this sermon. Uh, Jesus was preaching uh, to an audience. Remember, Matthew's audience is primary Jewish. He's sharing these things. He's sharing this sermon. A lot have lived through this sermon. A lot have lived, been a part of the sermon. Matthew's sharing it. And this is what Jesus says as we've gone through what we call the Beatitudes. He says, blessed are the what? Blessed are the what? Peacemakers. For they will be called what? Children. children of God. The children of God will be called what? Peacemakers. Peacemakers. Now Jesus is talking, again, he's talking to a group of people who are angry. He's talking to a group of people that are frustrated. They want peace. They're tired of being oppressed. They're tired of the way society and culture looks. They're tired of all the friction. But the way that they're expecting peace to come about in their idea versus what is Jesus actually speaking is two totally different things. And we see this in Jesus' words. See, the Romans rolled in and they just ruled with an iron fist. People were enslaved in this culture. They were... They, they, they would be, they, the, the Romans would go through and they would kill, especially men, just to put fear over everyone. They wanted to set an example of what will happen if you mess with us. Romans wanted the Jewish people to know they were here to stay and they weren't going anywhere and they kept squashing and oppressing the people. The Jewish people are living in this culture, in this time, they're living in, the, in oppression. And they're waiting for a Messiah. They're waiting for something, someone to deliver them from this, to change everything. Someone to lead them against the Romans. They have bought, in, they have bought into what Jesus... They, they kind of get the idea, they're thinking that Jesus might just be this guy. They're seeing some... Things that indicate that he might be this guy, that Jesus has developed this following, that he seems to be this wise, he seems, he, he seems to have these miraculous powers, he seems to be doing these amazing things, and Jesus is right there on this hillside, and he says to them, they're all excited, thinking this could be him, and he says to them, blessed are the peacemakers. What? Blessed are the peacemakers. 
peacemakers. We don't want peace. We want war. We want to defeat the Romans. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Notice what Jesus doesn't say here. He doesn't say, blessed are the peacekeepers. Don't get peacemakers and peacekeepers mixed up. He doesn't say, blessed are the peacekeepers. I, 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 and don't, again, maybe you write this down in your notes and this is something just for your knowledge, but don't raise your hand or say anything. But are you kind of the peacekeeper in your family? Are you kind of, have you kind of been called down to, as the peacekeeper? And, and you like kind of this idea of the peacekeeper or the peace lover? Do, don't confuse what Jesus is saying here with the peacekeeper or the peace lover. He's saying, blessed are the peacemakers. See, a peacemaker, and we've talked about this before, but let me just kind of walk through this real quickly, and you can just jot these down in your notes. If you, some of you want to catch up with it later on, catch me after the service, and I'll give these words back to you again, because I'm going to run through these real quick, quickly. But a peacemaker, peacemakers are active. Peacemakers are willing to wade into conflict. They're not afraid of conflict. Peacemakers humbly pursue reconciliation. Notice that word humbly. Peacemakers choose not to be offended. How easily are you offended? How easily already when I start asking questions did you get offended? How easily do you get offended? Peacemakers choose not to be offended. Peacemakers speak truth in love. Peacemakers speak truth in love. Jesus is saying this is more than peacekeeping. This is peacemaking. Jesus was not a peacekeeper. You can write that in your notes, please. Jesus was not a peacekeeper. If you think that, if that's your idea of Jesus this weekend, then it's a false idea of who Jesus was. He didn't come to keep the peace between the people. In fact, Jesus it was willing to wade into the messiness of people's lives. He was willing to confront and speak the truth even when it wasn't what they wanted to hear. Case in point, what we're talking about this weekend. Jesus never worried about keeping the peace. Well, I wonder if I should. Jesus never. I wonder if I should say this. I wonder what the audience will say, think about me. I wonder what the disciples will say. I, I wonder what those religious leaders are thinking. Man, he walks away. I never should have said that. If we're a follower of Jesus, then we are to be, here's the word, we are to be agents, agents of bringing peace to a broken Messed up world. We're to be agents of that. Now I realize that when we hear that this, then we think we, we should, then that kind of goes back to peacekeepers, if you will. That kind of, then that means we are to be people that are going around settling disputes. That even within the church world, it's our responsibility to settle disputes. It's our responsibility in culture, in our community, in our family to settle disputes. In fact, we may even find that we actually like or enjoy being that kind of person. I kind of like diving in and settling that dispute. You know, hey, will you come up? Hey, what do you think about this? Will you, will you settle this argument? Have you ever been asked to settle an argument with somebody? Well, let's let such and such settle this. What do they think? And we kind of get caught on enough, and we kind of like that feeling, we like that idea. But here's the problem. The problem is, is when when the 
this dispute is with someone in us. So we have to be willing to actually lose in order. Let me say that again. Y'all you know I like to win, right? <laughs> yeah, I know how uh, we talk about this multiple times through different messages, how competitive I can be, even with my children. And I had to kind of paper that down and watch that at times. Um, I like to win. We have to be willing to lose. We have to be willing to lose. We have to be willing to wade in the mess. We have to be willing to do this for relationships to win. Some of you might be thinking, no, not happening. It's just not happening. What about my rights? What about, what about, I really am right. You know, wait a minute, you're only hearing one side of the story. You're not hearing my side of the story. Well, wait a minute, some of you are thinking, this is wishful thinking, and, and, and this will never happen. This is never, this will never take place. It's not possible. Our culture is doomed. It's going downhill. It will never. There's a, we can't make it. No, there's no. So what happens? We eventually just settle. And a lot for a lot of times within the church, we settle. We end up fighting for our side. We end up fighting for what we think our rights. Or we avoid, or we just throw up our hands and we just give up. And Jesus is teaching us in these words, he's saying, he's teaching us that peace with God equips us to make peace with others. Let me say it again. Peace with God equips us to make peace with others. See, the idea of peacemaking seems so hard. It seems, especially right now, even in preparation for this message, you know, in, in some of the discussions Susan and I were talking about, it, it just it, it, it seems so unrealistic to these people listening. Jesus, do you not see what's going on? Do you not open your eyes? Do you not know what we're going through? And Jesus says, Here's the great news. I'm going to get you right with God, and that will allow you to make peace with others. See, if we look back, we see this struggle for uh, followers of Jesus and for his church all down through the history of the church. If you look all throughout, if you look, as, if you should dive in, you see this over and over again in Scripture, specifically all through the early church. Case in point, look what the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Rome. There was this conflict that, was, that the church was experiencing in Rome. Paul writes to the church in Rome where followers of Jesus disagreed about everything. I mean, they were disagreeing about everything. They were disagreeing from the food that they ate to the holidays that they would actually celebrate. If we look very specifically, if you look at this time period, what, what, what Paul addresses Let's take, for instance, this issue of food. How many of you like to eat? Raise your hand if you like to eat. How many of you like to eat meat? How many of you like steak? Hamburger? Okay. Ribeye? Mm. Uh, I, Susan and I ate last night. You know, we're, we're kind of dabbing our feet a little bit with an empty nester thing. Y'all yeah, know that, right? And we ate last night at... What is it called? Taco Mama? Mama Taco, whatever, whatever, something like that. I had a big, huge beef burrito. Oh my goodness. 
Oh, man. I just want to stand up and praise God and worship right there. <laughs> Some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you are offended by that. Why? Because you're a vegetarian. <laughs> How many vegetarians are here? You wouldn't dare raise your hand if you were, wasn't you? <laughs> and the church in Rome, that's what they were arguing over. That's the very issue they're arguing. Some of them people went on to eat meat. Some said, no, you need to be a vegetarian. The, the vegetarian lifestyle, basically. And division threatened the church. Why? Because the different groups thought everyone should hold to the same belief system that they did. Uh, to hold to this secondary issue. Right in your notes, secondary issues. Very few arguments, even within the church, and division within the church, and separation, and splits within the church down through the years, I would argue and say that really primary, most of them have never happened over really actual first line issues, biblical issues. They were secondary issues. If you go back and study Paul's words, it's interesting how Paul actually guided them to preserve the unity within the church there in Rome. He didn't tell them to create different churches. He didn't say, well, you know, I, I get this. I understand. So here's what I would do. Here's my solution. Those that love me, you go over here and you start your church. Those who love the idea and hold to the idea of being vegetarians, you go over here and start your church. He didn't say that. But if he would have, the fact is it probably would have been easier for the church to come together. Paul actually said the opposite. Paul called the church to build unity around Jesus. He called them to live. And this is what he says in Romans chapter 15, verses 5 and 6. He says these words right into what's going on in the church room. He says, in such harmony with one another and according with Christ Jesus, that together you may with what? Is it not up there? Did I not give this one to you? Oh, it says, well, then I'll show you. With one voice, with one voice. Glorify the God and glorify God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So how? We focus, say focus, focus. on Jesus. We focus on Jesus. We are united. We've already said not all, we don't all agree on certain things, but we are united, or we should be united on Jesus. And we focus in our unity as we come together and worship comes together on Jesus. See, Paul was telling the church that these issues were important. He's not saying they're not important. But they're important at the individual level. They didn't determine whether someone was, and get this now, Paul was saying this doesn't determine whether someone was a follower of Jesus or whether they should worship together or not. It was possible Get this now. It, Paul is saying it is possible to be a meat lover. Amen. Amen. <laughs> and follow Jesus. But he's also saying it is possible. Boo. <laughs> it is possible to be a vegetarian. And be a follower of Jesus as well. It is possible. Now, case in point, I will have to confess in this sermon. That over the course of time, because of some symptoms I started to develop last year, y'all are aware of, that my diet has changed considerably. So I have to watch. So I vary on that because of health reasons. From uh, So I do, uh, the, those of you that are vegetarian, I eat a lot of salads and different stuff like that. I have to adapt to that because of different health issues for me. But here's the thing I want you to get from this. He says, okay, you can be a follower of Jesus and love me. You can be a follower of Jesus and follow this idea of being a vegetarian. Not, but it, not only possible, but it, it was actually good. Paul is saying, not only is it possible, but it's, it's actually good for them to worship and serve together this way. Paul actually encouraged them to follow. Get this. Paul actually encourages them to follow their conscience. Doing what they believed 
was best in honoring Jesus according to his word. He told them to love individuals that had different ideas or convictions about these issues, these secondary issues. How many of you are aware of this? How many of you realize what's going on here? Look what Paul, Paul Roman, I think I gave this one to you. To put it on the screen, I think. Romans chapter 14, verses 5 and 8. I think I gave this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Romans chapter 14, verse 5 says, One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God. While the one who abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself. And none of us dies to himself. For we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are what? Lord. We are the Lord's. We're united by Jesus. Paul is saying that there are Areas where followers of Jesus are free to differ. He is saying individual followers are free to do what they believe best honors Jesus with these secondary issues. And he's saying those are not reasons to separate or divide. One more thing on this. If we even look closer, did you notice that Paul is actually saying, and, and, and write this in your notes, that he's actually, it's actually good to have strong convictions about what we believe best honors Jesus. Even if it causes us to disagree <coughs> with other followers of Jesus. He's saying it's okay to disagree. And just because you disagree shouldn't be reasons to separate. Paul actually says each one should be fully convinced in his mind. See, when we're dealing with issues about things, we are to disagree as followers of Jesus. God tells us to love. Look what it says in Romans chapter 12, verse 10. It says, love each other what? Love each other with genuine affection. Genuine affection. And take delight in honoring each other. Man, if culture, if culture, if we just back right there, put that on a billboard. Love each other with genuine affection. Doesn't say we all have to agree, but we love one another with genuine affection and we take delight in honoring each other. No matter whether someone agrees with you or not, we all are created in the image of God. Amen. Whether they believe or whether someone believes in God or not, they're created in the image of God. So when you engage in an argument with someone or a disagreement or get combated or whatever it looks like or they do, we need to realize they are created in the image of God. They may not be acting like a follower of Christ. They may be far from acting like a follower of Christ, but they are created in the image of God. And we need to realize that. And we need to treat each other in that way. We shouldn't pass judgment on one another simply because we disagree on some non-essential issues. Love one another. But Paul doesn't stop there. Flip with me over in your Bibles. I want you to see it's over to Ephesians. It'll be on the screen as well. But Paul actually addresses this in the church in Ephesus. Over in Ephesians chapter 2, beginning with verse 14 and 15, the first part of it, he says this. He says, for he himself is our peace who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, that the, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. These two groups of people, what is Paul talking about? What are the two groups? They're the Jews and the non-Jews. Or a better way to say it, it's the Jews and the Gentiles. Now put this in your notes. You have Jews, you have Gentiles, and then you know that the gospel is also taken, we see there in the early part of Acts, was taken to Samaria. Which would mean they were Samaritans. The Samaritans were what? They were half Jew, half Gentile. And God says, this is my church, and throws them all together. You got Jew, Gentile. Jews, very systematic. Very traditional. We're going to do it this way, at this time.
behind this way like this. Gentiles. Uh-uh. <laughs> We're going to get down to business. Yes! Woo! Who are you? Jews going, ain't happening. No. Shh. Be quiet. Gentiles. Uh-uh. Jesus Christ died for me. Shh. Y'all see what's going on? That's what God said this one church. Puts them all together, Jew, Gentile. And they hated one another. These groups hated one another. He says there was there he, he says there's this division, there's this wall, there's a hostility. He says, the spirit, you're squashing the spirit, if you will. The spirit can't move because you you there's so much division and hostility between you. Now, you fill in the blank. Who is out with you? Don't answer out loud. But who's out with you? Where is their hostility? Where is their divide? See, it's whoever is on that side of the wall of hostility that Paul is. It, it, it says that Jesus is our peace. We can't miss this. The reason Christianity changed the world, if you look at various seasons of history of the church, was because they were willing to put aside their differences for the sake of the greater cause. They were united with Jesus and moving forward. It wasn't their political view. It wasn't who they voted for that changed society. Well, that would change culture. No, it's when the church rises up, sets aside its division and its divide, and starts to realize that we are united under Jesus. And you see that all throughout the history of the church. Jesus puts all this together. Jesus had modeled this. Think about this. If you look back, even in the life of the ministry, Jesus modeled this for everybody. He did by allowing tax collectors and Gentiles and, and Jews to be a part of the followers. Think about the disciples, the mixture of the disciples. He loves them. He puts them all together. And now they're sent out to change the world. Showing, write this in your notes, please. Showing that, yes, we come from different backgrounds. Yes, we look differently. Yes, we smell differently. Yes, we have different ideas. But we can set them aside. And we can work together. We can set aside. We're able to move past the dividing wall of hostility. Ephesians, if you go on and look in chapter 2, verses, second part of 15, and verse 16 says, His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He is saying that death of, the death of Jesus on the cross brings all of us together. See, the Jews needed Jesus to die on the cross. Guess what? Gentiles need Jesus to die on the cross. The Jews need the tempted temple. They, the Jews need the tomb to be empty. Let me slow down and say that correctly. The Gentiles need the tomb to be empty. They need Jesus to do what he did. Jesus paid the price that we can have the peace with God. And it is because of that peace that we can have peace with each other. Let me say it like this. Because of what God has forgiven us for, we have the ability to forgive others. Amen? Amen. Amen. Because of what he's forgiven us. <clears throat> Jesus was going 
willing to do that for you and I, even though you and I don't deserve it. Jesus says this is the best way, the best way to live. Write it in your notes, please. Jesus says this is the best way to live. Jesus is saying you and I have to let go. <coughs> Common theme we keep bringing up. Close fist, open hand. Close <coughs> fist, open hand. We've got to be willing to let go. So the question is, in, in the little bit of time we have just left, real quickly, how do we do this then? It's not possible. Some of you are out there, and some of y'all already tuned this out. You think it's not possible. Well, let me remind you how to tune in me, how you're tuning in what God is saying now. This is the very minute, this is what Jesus is saying to people that were oppressed, the people that were being put to death. How do we do this? The goal is to make, is, is, in making peace, being peacemakers. How do we do this? Write this down real quickly, just these two things. If we start doing this, I think it will totally shift and help us in our own lives, help us in, 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 as we move forward then our circle of influence, real quick word. Number one is this, become slow to share. I've talked about this before, become slow to share. I'm willing to make peace, but before I make peace, I wanna get my story out there. I gotta get my opinion out there. I gotta get my idea out there. I gotta rally my group of people together. I'll make peace with you, but I want you to know I got this people behind me, following me, agreeing with me. I want them to know my story. Why? Why do we do this? Because we feel the need to justify ourselves. We feel the need to justify ourselves. Instead of letting Jesus justify us. See, there's nothing you can do. There's nothing you can do. Jesus has already done. Is accepting that deal. So we become slow to share. You might say we become slow, if you will, to speak. But I love the way, so that's for we slow to share, slow to bed. But I love the way James says this here. He, uh, like this, he, says, he says, if you're familiar with James' word, James says, be quick to what? Listen. Now, let me just, can I, can I give a little personal, you know, this is hard for me. Because I like to win. And because I am a preacher, because I communicate, I like to talk. But I have to also realize that the Lord reminds me every time I look in the mirror, I don't have no hair, so I can see it even more. Some of you hair, you kind of blocks it, so maybe you don't get it. But I, maybe, some of us need to see it more than others, I guess that's what it is. The Lord gave me big ears. <laughs> gave me big ears. Which is what? It's a reminder to me, Jonathan, you need to listen. But more than that, just being quick to listen, but what we talk about this so often is when you listen is do you actually hear what the person is saying? Do they just you do you just hear garbage and words coming out or do what or do you actually hear what they are saying? <coughs> Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 says, Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will what? See the Lord. Romans 12, 18 says, If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. But here's the thing. Here's the reality of it. Not everyone's going to let you. Not everyone's going to let you. Not everyone, including in here. Not everyone is going to let Not everyone's going to move beyond whatever it is. 
But as far as it depends on you and me, as far as it depends on you and me, live at peace with everyone. So what does it take? It takes willing to get our feet wet, willing to get into the mess, willing to wade in the muck. Why? Because when we do, when we do, write this down in your notes, please, and I promise after this I'm done. Write this down in your notes. Because when we do, we become what? And I know more than anything in the world, I want to be this. I want to be a child of God. When we do this, we become children of God. Children of God. How important is this to Jesus? Peacemakers. Promise. 